Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lippman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University, and this is the Alan B. Levan Innovation Center, which is a co-coordinated uh, uh, project between uh, Broward County and Nova Southeastern University, and we're very proud. Today we have an incredible uh, opportunity to hear from an expert. Uh, we're going to be talking about ba base skull surgery and how to treat brain tumors. Now, one would want to know why is we, we're going into such a subject. It's because you, the audience, have asked questions. So let me introduce to you Daniel R. Klinger, MD, who is a neurosurgeon with Broward Health. Welcome, doctor. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and speak with your audience today. Thank you, sir. Uh, before I go much further, I want to thank you um, on behalf of all the folks that are watching us and myself included for your service uh, to the United States. Uh, you are a, a lieutenant colonel. It says retired, but I know that you were actively involved in the military for quite a while. What is a neurosurgeon? You know, a lot of folks have interaction with physicians, you know, that they meet on a regular basis, they're primary care doctors, but the field of neurosurgery is kind of a small subset of medicine. And we're a subspecialized group of surgeons. We do our training to treat neurological disorders. So we do surgery to treat disorders of the, of the spine. So neck issues, low back issues, from herniated discs, basically arthritic processes causing compression of nerves, compression of the spinal cord. Um, but also brain conditions as well. So brain tumors, vascular lesions of the brain, congenital lesions of the brain. Um, we do specialized training in that. It's a long residency program, and uh, that's what we focus on completely. So we don't we don't do any general surgery. We it's all related to neuro neurological disorders. Well, I want to obviously congratulate uh, Broad Health for, for establishing uh, an opportunity to have someone such as yourself, Dr. Klinger, uh, be available. Because there are, the reason why we wanted to do this program is that we have a, we, we listeners send us a lot of questions. And we, we are consistently uh, receiving questions about head and neck pain. I got headaches, uh, my neck is stiff, my, my back hurts, uh, and I said to myself exactly what you just explained to the viewing public. Uh, that's why we have you here today. A couple areas, I mean, I'll say in, with spine conditions, those are actually more common in the community. So, so as neurosurgeons, I'll see probably four or five spine patients for every one patient that has a, a cranial issue, okay, a brain issue. But uh, in terms of spine, many patients in the community over their lifetime suffer from neck pain, low back pain. Fortunately, the majority of those will be managed without any kind of surgery. We can manage them conservatively with, with medication, rest, sometimes lifestyle modification, physical therapy. Uh, there's other treatments short of surgery that, that patients often will, will go for, like uh, injections or interventional treatments um, with small procedures with needles or catheters where patients are in and out of the office the same day. But there's a group of patients, you know, maybe about 10 to 15 percent where the, the issues just become chronic or they're causing really significant deficits or disability for the patient. So severe pain often radiating pain into an extremity. We call that radicular pain because it's pain that's often comes from, from irritation or compression of a nerve root uh, or weakness, so neurologic, true neurological deficits. And it's those patients who are kind of failing these conservative treatments or have very severe symptoms that, that often come to the neurosurgeon and need surgery. And uh, we have a lot of treatments that are effective and get patients back to, back to function really with, with limited time away from work and limited time away from doing what they want to do. You know, uh, again, the, reflecting on some of the queries from the public, uh, one always thinks about, you know, brain or the, the, the skull 
as an impervious thing until they, they watch someone getting uh, hurt on a football field or getting into a car crash or uh, unfortunately we have so many uh, people who end up uh, in motorcycle accidents without wearing helmets and things of that nature. Uh, the, uh, there is uh, such a connectivity, I believe, and you've already touched on it, between the skull itself, the neck, and other body functions. So can we talk a bit about that? Your primary care doctor in general is going to be the best, you know, first resource to come with any kind of medical issues. But, but of course, they, they can't be an expert in any field, right? And, um, you know, that's where often will come into play. So, and there can be quite a bit of overlap. So that's kind of our expertise is trying to parse out, you know, what, what symptoms that the patient's having might be red flags that they're concerning that we need to investigate further, um, get imaging like an MRI scan to see if there's any concerning pathology. You know, what's, what's something that based on our neurological assessment, based on our kind of understanding of the patient's anatomy, of their physical exam findings and their complaints are more likely to come from a, a, you know, a disorder in the brain versus something lower down in the spinal cord or just something, you know, not even not neurological per se, or, you know, maybe related to a gastrointestinal is, issue, a urologic issue, those kind of things. So, so we kind of help parse that out, uh, determine what the best course is for the patient. It's not always surgery, of course, sometimes it's, um, you know, other form of treatment or even referral to other specialist if that it, it is more the issue going on. Um, but when it is something that's related to the neurological system, that's kind of our, our expertise. You know, uh, with, a, with a, here we are in South Florida and uh, when you recognize that in the state of Florida, we have the highest percentage of any state in the union of people 70 and older. Uh, does age play into a lot of the patient volume that you see, or is it cause and effect of uh, things that are normal and natural to the growth process or uh, uh, the, the accident issues involved? So, uh, that's a great question, and definitely age comes into play. So, you know, as we age, unfortunately, we get more degenerative issues um, throughout our bodies, right? It can affect um, orthopedic systems, you know, our, our knees, our shoulders, uh, pain, arthritis, disability. In the same way, it affects the spinal, spinal column. So we do see as patients age in general, and there's probably genetic factors involved as well, why some patients get um, develop more issues than others. There's definitely lifestyle issues. You know, folks, unfortunately, who have risk factors who are significantly overweight or, or maybe folks who are very active, lead a very active lifestyle, put their body through quite a bit over the years. But, you know, as folks age, unfortunately, they do develop more uh, spine issues, neurological issues, and then just the risk of developing a brain issue that even though that risk absolute and an absolute number is relatively low, does go up just as we spend more years on this planet. Um, and then, and then, and in terms of the, you know, also folks as they age, we always have to worry about things like osteoporosis, developing fractures in the bones, which can affect the spine, be quite disabling. So, so yeah, it is unfortunate. It's very important just to keep monitor our health very closely as we age, uh, monitor these symptoms, and then seek help if it's, you know, they're, they're really causing a uh, significant decrease in the quality of life for patients. You know, uh, one of the uh, ongoing questions that comes to us in multiple categories or multiple uh, areas of uh, medical care is minimally invasive surgical techniques. So could you offer some comment to uh, how one is involved with working on the skull or working on the head and neck area through a minimally invasive technique? Sure. What, you know, what these are is, is basically kind of evolutions in how we treat patients in the surgery and, and also kind of a mindset of how, you know, what's the way we can, we can do surgery, which by nature is an invasive process, right? But, but do it in a way that causes less harm, that causes less tissue disruption for the patient, 
that we can expedite their recovery, we can speed up their recovery, uh, and that hopefully we can decrease the overall risks and complications for the patient. So um, we can have better outcomes all around. And the, the skull-based procedures, you know, what that is, it's kind of what I do with this is it's a subset within neurosurgery and it's kind of taking the, the normal approaches, which are, you know, usually when we access the brain, we do what's called a craniotomy. So we make some kind of incision on the scalp. Uh, we reflect tissue of the scalp, sometimes some muscle tissue, like the tissue over our temple. We have a muscle there called our temporalis muscle that kind of protects us and covers the scalp that you feel when you bite down. So we, we move those tissues out of the way and then we create an opening in the skull in the brain to get to that pathology. With the skull-based approaches, we're kind of tailoring that to, to really minimize any disruption to normal brain. So, so we're re removing more bone at the base of the skull, usually with a drill, with fine instruments, so that we can kind of work around the brain to get to the pathology and cause less retraction of the brain itself, less disruption of the normal brain pathways or tracks. And um, that leads to less, less complications and, and usually a quicker recovery for the patient. And it also expands on what we can offer for patients, you know, that we can treat things that before we'd say, oh, this is too high risk. Well, the, the other thing is that uh, w w which comes into almost multiple areas that we get into, people want to know about uh, the issue of dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, now, this might be a bit out of the, 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 the discussion of surgical issues on base, uh, base skull surgery, but I, I gotta, I've got to believe that a lot of people are sent to you, your neurologic practice uh, because they have uh, exhibited issues relative to I've st I've I've I can't I don't I'm not walking correctly I I uh, I, I can't remember something et cetera, et cetera. Do you see a lot of that? We do see that not not uncommonly and um, you know Alzheimer's is is basically a neurodegenerative condition that uh, a large amount of the population kind of de can develop as they age. It, the risk increases with age. There are some genetic. Uh, mutations that, that make patients a little bit more likely to develop it, unfortunately, and it can have a positive family history of it as well. Um, and Alzheimer's itself is right now not a surgical disorder, but a lot of times folks have some of the corresponding symptoms like you just mentioned, some memory loss, confusion, cognitive issues, maybe balance or gait issues. And, you know, for a layperson, or they haven't had a complete evaluation, sometimes they'll ascribe it. Well, it's just it's normal aging, or this is Alzheimer's, something that you know we just have to live with. But sometimes we'll find things that you know there's another process going on. You know, for instance, severe compression of the spinal canal in the in the in the neck can cause, and the spinal cord in the neck can cause significant balance issues. So sometimes we'll 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 pick up other things that are treatable. Uh, number one, and number two, when folks do have the when it we don't find these other treatable conditions per se, or we can treat with surgery. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get patients with these neurodegenerative conditions, cognitive issues like Alzheimer's and plug them in with a neurologist, another neurological specialist, kind of help in terms of, are there any medical treatments that are coming down the pipe that can help in terms of slow down the progression of this? Are there lifestyle changes or, or changes in the home that patients can make or their family can make to make this process easier to deal with. Yeah, I, I can I, I can tell you that I I would say one of the it used to be the biggest communicative issues that came from the viewing public was obviously it's, uh, minimally invasive techniques are very very high because they they you know they they don't like cutting, they don't like blood, they don't like hospitalization. But who does? Here at Broward Health Medical Center where I work it's a major level one trauma center. So we see all the things that you think about, you know, you see the news stories on the local TV, um, you watch television shows, you know, fictional shows about really severe traumatic injuries and seeing doctors there. And we certainly see that, you know, bad car crashes, gunshot wounds, um, job related accidents, industrial accidents, you know, that are quite dramatic, but, but 
frankly, one of the most common things we see is, is older patients coming in um, with low velocity, low energy traumas, but they're having, they're having traumatic injuries. So fractures, uh, fractures of the neck, fractures of the lower back, uh, just from things like a fall from standing can, can cause this. And it's definitely a significant source of disability. And I think, you know, if there's a lot of factors involved with that. I mean, if from a, from a broad standpoint, I think kind of prevention, you know, recognizing some of these things, having resources available, you know, to, to help older patients, uh, family support, social support. These are the kind of things that help prevent some of these things or, or minimize risk of it before the injuries actually happen. Um, but also, um, you know, improving the treatments that we have to hopefully get these patients out of the hospital because we know they're higher risk uh, of having a poor outcomes just because of their other health issues often. Yeah, I, 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 I have to uh, just, I had this conversation with a, with a friend uh, just a few days ago, uh, and I sort of scolded uh, him and his wife for the fact that they didn't have grab bars in the, in the stall shower and in the, uh, the bathroom area. Uh, it, it's just a, a simple little task that should be accomplished to prevent uh, the, 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 the dramatic uh, injury that's caused by uh, a trip or slip and fall. And I, I, I'm, 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 I'm hoping that the listeners uh, that are in that situation would take heed relative to that type of uh, uh, addition to their living area. Uh, the other thing is that uh, often, and I, I sort of uh, talk to our viewers and say, don't just let that headache go by or that little problem of a walking and tripping go by or the pain in your back go by. Just don't walk into a supermarket or to a pharmacy and pick something off the shelf that says it's a pain reliever or, or it relieves um, uh, inflammation or things of that nature. See your doctors. I, I'm sure that you underscore that with high intensity. Well, yeah, I agree 100%. I mean, I think, you know, it's not every patient, but some patients, you know, they have a hesitancy to, to bring up issues to their physician for probably a, a number of reasons, but I think it's very important, you know, when, when something is causing an issue for the patient where it's, um, you know, intractable pain, you know, that's not controlled, um, a, a disability that they're, that they're trying to deal with it, that really needs to be addressed because uh, as you kind of mentioned, a lot of times we have treatments available that can, that can help and, and restore some of their function, improve their quality of life. And, and we want to nip these kind of issues in the bud when we can to prevent it snowballing into a bigger issue. Well, Lieutenant Colonel, as uh, Dr. Klinger, as I would always remember that in the, uh, in the military, you always have to know who your buddy is on the right and to the left of you because that is no different than making sure that we have uh, proper uh, grab bars and proper attention to uh, uh, a potential slip and fall. Do you agree? I agree. So, I mean, prevention, I think, is the, is, you know, the, the best step I think patients can take as they age. And it, it's tough because, you know, we often don't think about that. And maybe we prepare for certain phases of our life. But, but as we age, it's not something we we'll want to think about, I think, in terms of losing some degree of our activity, our independence, our, and, and um, you know, our limitations. Um, and then just having those resources, you know, being plugged in your physician, having your medications checked regularly, Sim it, it, simple things as so often as like, I, I didn't realize I, I'd been taking these blood pressure medications and had been checking my blood pressure and patient's blood pressure gets low, they have a fall and then they have a significant injury to secondary to that. So, so all those kind of medical maintenance issues are very important. You know, one, one of the things that uh, this insidious uh, COVID virus has uh, presented to us other than the unfortunate deaths and, uh, and uh, sequelae, the illnesses afterwards, uh, is an, an, an attentive public now relative to where do I get health care and how quick do I get it? It's been an interesting few years that we've gone through, you know, as a country and, and as a 
world, I guess you could say, you know, going through the, living through this pandemic in real time. And I mean, it's, it's certainly cast a spotlight on the public health. I mean, I think that wasn't an issue on a lot of people's radar before, but they're realizing that, you know, how, how critical it can be, you know, when things like this COVID pandemic, you know, a, a, a very active flu season, all these kind of issues. And um, I think, you know, there's been challenges with it and uh, ways that the health systems had to adapt. I think Broward, you know, where I'm working here at Broward is is a great model in many respects because it's a, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a safety net hospital for the community. So, you know, we're open to folks at, <coughs> You know, essentially, you know, whether they come insured, uninsured, we're taking care of the community in general, but we're also, you know, offering very high tech care for patients who, you know, have very complex issues that need referral from other centers. Uh, and then finally, I would just say that, you know, there's been a push with this to realize that, you know, our health resources and hospital resources are limited. So you mentioned before the minimally invasive surgery we're trying to do our procedures where patients are spending minimal, if any time in the hospital to free up our healthcare system. So, the, so as much as we can do, you know, and, and this has been a, a long time coming and it's, it's improved. You know, look at orthopedic procedures, you look at neurosurgery procedures, you know, 20, 30 years ago, patients spending a week plus in the hospital after undergoing, you know, surgery for their lower back. Nowadays, they're often going home the same day or within, you know, a day or two. So I think that is one way we've kind of helped even even though we don't you know as a subspecialist i'm not i'm not directly treating patients with with covid for instance but by practicing more efficiently i can i can free up healthcare resources for our community overall well that's 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 really really uh, the if there is any blessing that came out of this horrible pandemic uh it's the uh analysis of trying to make uh the, uh, shall we say, the functional responsibilities of hospitals uh, more, uh, uh, shall we say, reviewed and uh, looked at to try to do exactly what you said. The patients need not to be in the hospital for long periods of time, not only because of the new techniques, but also because of the realization of the fact that uh, they, there's someone else that needs help. That's for sure. Uh, let me just touch on one other thing, and that is that uh, I, I know this is not necessarily in uh, the area that you deal with, but you know, uh, we, we have a, 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 an awful lot of uh, mental health problems in our uh, nation, really, and the community, maybe the world. Uh, but uh, I, I think a lot of the, the uh, problems themselves turn out to be uh, partially involved with neurologic issues. Have you seen any studies lately relative to that? Well, I would say you know, that, that mental health major issue, of course, throughout the, the U.S., but sometimes, you know, it's true there can be true um, neurologic pathology that's actually causing the mental health issues. And that, that's not necessarily the majority of the case, but but they need to be evaluated by their healthcare professional. You know, if there's concern, sometimes we'll get, you know, brain imaging, you know, to, to be sure we're not missing something along those lines. Um, I, I've seen many cases of a you know large brain tumor, you know, masquerading as a patient coming in as with with um, cognitive issues, mental health issues. Um, so again, not not to say that every patient with depression has has a, a brain lesion, but um, it just more to emphasize that it's important to get worked up by your physician completely, you know, and, and not, not just kind of some kind of armchair treatment. Yeah. Not, not just stethoscope and take your blood pressure. Correct. <laughs> uh, I, I understand. Well, Dr. D uh, Klinger, uh, and, uh, I, I, once again, I, I salute your service to this country and, and you are Lieutenant Colonel, in my mind, so uh, we'll just repeat it again. Uh, uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity that you've given us today uh, to communicate with uh, the public uh, in South Florida. It's been my pleasure to uh, spend a part of my morning with you guys. Thank you. Well, folks, uh, we, uh, we, we 
this was a very difficult area, but we, we had, like I said, we had some qu uh, queries relative to uh, neurologic issues, but mostly head and, uh, and uh, I guess you could say brain issues. Uh, and I thought that the best way to do it is to go to the next expert, and that's was Dr. Daniel R. Klinger, MD, who is a neurosurgeon and uh, it has this broad knowledge. So I hope that uh, this program brought you some information. Remember, I always tell you, you must talk to your physicians. The only way to get to people like Dr. Klinger is through some recognition of the fact that you might have a, an, a problem that cannot be cared for by your, uh, shall we say, uh, primary care physician. Uh, so uh, remember, take good care of yourself. This program is called Dateline Health. My name is Fred Lippman, but before I hang up here, before I close up, I want you to know that we have an address and a phone number right here if you have any questions. Feel free to use it. Again, my name is Fred Lippman. Until next time, see you.